And uh, so, furthermore, yeah, a noble disciple recollects the Sangha. The Sangha of the Buddha's disciple is practicing the good way or the way that's good. So uh, now we come to the contemplation of the, uh, the Sangha, and the Sangha is really an outcome of the Dhamma. So you have the Buddha who sees uh, the nature of reality, he preach, practice, he teaches the Dhamma, which then uh, gives other people access to the same insight. And then when they practice, well, they become the Sangha. So what we're talking about here is the noble Sangha. We're talking about those people who actually have the same insight as the Buddha. This is what this means. Uh, so that always begs the question, who are, who are these people in the Noble Sangha? How do we know who they are? And uh, this is very hard, yeah? The reality is that very often we are deluded about these things. Uh, very often we find people who have faith in the wrong people, uh, and they become very disappointed, uh, really, really disappointed when those people turn out to be scallywags or they don't really live up to the standards or, or whatever it is. Uh, and you see this very, very often. It's a very common thing in the Buddhist world. Uh, and so it is important that when we have faith in the Sangha, it is often more as an idea that there are Aryans and noble people in the world. Of course, some people in the world will represent that Sangha more, better than others. Some people will be closer to the ideal. You see they have the qualities that you expect of someone who is an Aryan. But it's always good to hold back a little bit and to understand that this is more like a a theoretical thing, yeah, it is more like, it is not, it's a little bit abstract. Uh, if you concretize it too much into individuals, uh, then you may end up being very disappointed. Uh, uh, of course, the better you know somebody, uh, the more you investigate somebody, the more grounds you have for having confidence in that person. Uh, yes, yeah? so also investigate over the long term, uh, yeah, uh, but always also understand that uh, it is very difficult to know if someone really has profound insight or not. Uh, it's very easy to kind of play the game and to, uh, you know, to look the part without actually really uh, being, being the part, if you wish. So, uh, so, the, so, so in, in one way, this is a little bit abstract. Uh, on the other hand, we also need real examples in the world because it is very nice to see people who actually exemplify the Dhamma, who are real living examples of it. It also matters. Uh, and the way to do that is to investigate carefully, yeah? if someone really is worthy of your confidence or not. Uh, and uh, remember, just because someone is famous uh, is not a good reason for having faith in a person. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Uh, it depends. Uh, people are famous for all kinds of things. Uh, the Buddha was fairly famous. Okay, in that case, you had a very good reason for having confidence in him. Uh, and uh, some of the Aryans will become famous because uh, uh, Aryans, obviously, they will generally attract people because of their character. Uh, uh, but sometimes there are other people who are not Aryans who become famous for all kinds of other reasons. Uh, so trust your judgment. Uh, yeah, look carefully. Uh, don't just go with the crowd. Uh, don't be that uh, sheep. Don't be, it's better to be the black sheep than to be the white sheep. Uh, yeah, I always, I always preferred black sheep rather than the white because the black sheep uh, they think for themselves. Uh, they go a different route. Uh, when everyone else goes over the cliff and dies, uh, the black sheep goes a different direction. Yeah. <laughs> The black sheep survives, uh, but be a, be the kind of the uh, the kind of smart black sheep, not the stupid black sheep. That's kind of the idea here. Uh. And uh, in in a sense, the Buddha, you know, it, maybe this is kind of dangerous dangerous thing to say, but uh, you can uh, you can either say the Buddha was a black sheep, or you can say the Buddha was a white sheep among black sheep. Yeah, everyone else was black. There's another way of thinking about it. Uh, the Buddha thought for himself. He didn't follow the crowd. Uh, he did something different. Uh. And to me, these are some of the most inspiring people in the world, those who actually dare to do things differently. Yeah. And to me, Ajahn Brahm is a very good example of that, yeah? this daring to go against the crowd, uh, but to do it with integrity, not to do it kind of in a bad way or in bad faith, but, but to do it out of goodwill, do it out of kindness, do it with integrity. Yeah. And uh, you see that in someone like Ajahn Brahm, is a person with incredibly high degree of integrity. I've been sitting next to Ajahn Brahm for... Uh, 30 years, yeah, or well, not next to him all the time, but I've been kind of close to him for 30 years. Uh, and uh, the, the weird thing is that, you know, often they say that familiarity breeds contempt is one of those kind of old sayings. Uh, but I had to admit that over those 30 years, my respect for Ajahn Brahm is just always keeps on growing. Uh, it has never really gone down. Uh, 
And it's because I think my own appreciation of the, appreciation of the Dhamma is also growing. And so because that is growing, I can see more the qualities that are there. And uh, someone like Ajahn Brahm, they're very, very independent. Uh, if the whole world goes one way and he feels it's wrong, he will go separately. He's a classic black sheep. Yeah? <laughs> he will go his own way because he knows it's right. Yeah? He doesn't care what everyone else thinks. And that's kind of, there's something very beautiful about that. And when you see the way he does it, he does it in the right kind of way. Yeah? And the other thing about Ajahn Brahm, which is really, really inspiring, Ajahn Brahm is one of the most famous Buddhist monks in the whole world. Yeah? He has seen these listings. They had this, I remember this English magazine, Spiritual Magazine, had the listings of the most important spiritual leaders in the world. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm was one of the few top pe people in the top 100 on that list. Uh, it was like the Pope yeah, and that kind of thing. And Ajahn Brahm was in there, a bit further down than the Pope. <laughs> but uh, still, he was there. And despite his fame, despite kind of all the books that he sells, despite all of these kind of things, uh, when you see him, he's like, he's like just completely ordinary. Yeah. There's no sense of ego. There's no sense of I am important at all. He's just this very ordinary person, yeah. And you, you, you know what he's like when he comes here, right? You wouldn't think that this person is important or anything like that, yeah. He kind of this kind of goofing around and his robe is trailing on the ground and he just tells silly jokes, you know. Then he laughs. Uh, then he just disappears back into his room and you don't see him. And then he, he kind of comes out again. Yeah, there, there's something very simple and kind of very ordinary about someone like yeah. Uh, uh, um, someone like Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and a lot of people who are very um, attained like that, who have very kind of high, deep meditation and very deep in insight into the truth, they kind of tend to fade away. They're not important. They don't say, here I am, yeah, I am important, yeah. People with a big ego, they will always kind of, attention will kind of point towards them, right, in a certain way, because of the ego is important. Uh, and But people who have no ego, they will kind of just fade away into the background. Uh, so the people who fade away, they're the ones you should play, have confidence in that, because they are the ones with small ego, small sense of self. And so uh, this is how you can kind of start to get an idea of who really is inspiring. Uh, people who have few possessions, uh, people who live a really simple life, even though they're very famous. Uh, yeah? People who are consistently kind, uh, people who are, uh, uh, you know, these are, you know the qualities of the Dhamma, yeah? what to look out for. Uh, and so you watch for that, and you trust your judgment. Uh, and if something looks off, okay, I'll be careful with my judgment in that particular case. Uh, and then you are moving towards the idea of the Sangha and what the Sangha is about. The Sangha is, represents the Dhamma, represents the teaching of the Buddha. They are the living example of the Dhamma, if you like. Yeah. And there are still Aryans in the world. Yeah, I have no doubt about that. Not many. The number is small, the number is dwindling, yeah, but there are still Aryans in the world in the present day. Yeah. So that's kind of really nice. Uh, and uh, so, um, anyway, so these are the disciples of the Buddha, yeah, those who are practicing the good way. The good way here is Supati Panno. And uh, so that's the good way. Uh, Patipanno is uh, practicing or practiced. Uh, and the good way is the way. Of the Eightfold Path, yeah? So they are practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, and the reason they are practicing it, because the Noble Disciples, they have, have internalized the Noble Eightfold Path. They are like made up of the Noble Eightfold Path. The Noble Eightfold Path is imprinted in their psyche. Yeah, this is kind of the way of thinking about it. Uh, the psychology, the psyche has been, uh, has been um, uh, changed according to the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and that's what they become, what they are. So they are practicing the good way. They practice in the direct way, because once you, the Noble Eightfold Path is internalized and is part of you, then there is no more deviations. Yeah? There's no detours, too many detours in this world. And uh, the history of Buddhism is the history of detours. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's because the history of Buddhism is all about, okay, now we find the shorter way, now we find the Mahayana, then the Vajrayana, then the pure land, yeah, just get reborn, Amitabha held the heaven, ding, reborn Amitabha, just hang out there for a long time and enjoy sensual pleasures, and bang, you become the next Buddha. It's a kind of a, it's a history of Buddhism, is like this continuation trying to find a shortcuts on the path. That's really what, what, what it is about. But the shortcut is given by the Buddha. The shortcut is the Noble Eightfold Path. Everything else is the detour. So make sure you don't take the detours. Come back to the shortcut, the direct path. Ujju Patipanna is what this is about. The way that is systematic, the Nyaya Patipanna. 
Yeah, the nyaya, the, um, uh, the system, this is often uh, called, this is often dependent origination in the suttas, is the nyaya, uh, because it is a system. And once you become a stream entry, you are, because you are undermining avidja, avidja is al already being undermined at the very beginning. In other words, the delusion, the confusion, the ignorance is already fundamentally undermined. It means that you are practicing the path of cessation, yeah, the path of getting out, the um, the cessation process of paticca samupada, of dep dependent origination. So you're practicing that system. You're on that um, conveyor belt that leads out of samsara. A cessation is going to happen for you uh, sooner or later. Yeah. This is a nyaya patipano. The way that is proper, samichi patipano. And uh, samichi means proper. It means proper. It just that's basically what it means. So it is the way that is appropriate or proper. In other words, it is uh, that which leads in the right direction and leads you out of this. Uh, if you want to get out, that is what you should be doing. It consists of the four pairs, the eight individuals. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the four pairs are the uh, stream enterer, the once returner, non returner, and the arahant. Uh, and the eight individuals are those that are on the path to each of these, and then the actual. The, the, the fruition attainment. Uh, so there is the, the person practicing to attain the fruit of stream entry and the stream entry. The person practicing to attain the fruit of once return and the once returner. The person practicing the fruit of non return and the non returner. The person practicing the fruit of arahantship and the arahant. These are the eight individuals. Uh, so you notice there are eight individuals, and so the uh, Sometimes, this is kind of where the Abhidhamma or the commentaries sometimes can be a bit uh, confusing because according to the commentaries, uh, there is Magga Pala and the Magga moment lasts one mind moment. Uh, so according to the commentary, sometimes these individuals, four of these individuals, uh, they only last one mind moment. Uh, so that's a bit strange, right? Can you be called an individual if you last one mind moment? Uh, I would say no. You don't really count at all if you only last one mind moment. Uh, so I would argue that, um, uh, and this is actually consistent in the, with other suttas as well, is that these are real individuals that last for a certain amount of time until they realize the fruit later on. Uh, so this is, this is one of those cases where the commentaries seem to be a little bit strange, not really fit all that well with the suttas. Uh. Anyway, so commentaries are usually very good, uh, and usually they are very useful, but sometimes they are, might be a little bit off. Uh. This is the Sangha of the Buddha's disciples that is worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods, worthy of hospitality, worthy of religious donation, worthy of greetings with joined palms. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, so worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods, Dakkinaya. How, how does this sequence go again? Dakkinaya. Paunayo, Paunayo Dakinayo. Where did it go? What does it start with? Ahunayo, Ahunayo, Paunayo Dakinayo, Anjali Karanayo. Thank you. Okay. I know these things if I'm, my mind is fresh, but when the mind gets tired, you lose everything. Everything just goes out the window. Man. <laughs> so, Ahunayo. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is, these are offerings. This is kind of the way that offerings were done in ancient India by the Brahmanical culture. And they would offer to the gods. But now those offering to the gods, they go to the monks instead because the monks or these people like the Buddha are higher than the gods. Yeah, So forget about the gods, now give it to the Aryas instead. So they're worthy of offerings to the gods. Kind of is a nice way of putting it. I've never seen it before. This is a Pantasujato innovation. Usually it just talks about offerings, yeah, not to the gods. Worthy of hospitality. I think that's fairly straightforward. Worthy of religious donation, or worthy of, uh, again, generosity again, and worthy of Anjali, greetings with joint palm, this is Anjali. And so the idea here is that uh, because uh, the Aryans are the custodians of the Buddha's message, uh, because they are the ones who understand what the Buddha is all about, uh, they are the ones who have the ability to teach the Dhamma in the right way. Uh, and so the Aryans have the ability to give you the highest gift. Uh, the Dhamma is the highest gift that can be given to anyone because it leads to the highest happiness and to all well-being. All other gifts are fairly small in comparison to the Dhamma. 
And so because the Aryans can give you the highest gift, just like any teacher who gives you something very worthwhile, uh, they are worthy of some kind of uh, return. Yeah, This is kind of the hospitality you give in return, uh, or the, the offerings that you give in return because of that. Uh. So this is kind of the way of thinking about the, sang the uh, Aryan Sangha, yeah? the, the ones who are the real custodians of the Buddhist teachings, uh, and who then bring it, uh, uh, bring it to the world. Uh. And then it says uh, at the end towards the end, it, it is the supreme field of merit uh, for the world. Uh, yeah, when you uh, give a gift to someone, if you give a gift to an individual, the highest gift is to give a gift to an arahant. Uh, yeah, that is kind of the best gift you can give. Uh, and uh, so these are therefore the supreme field of the merit for the world. Uh, even higher than giving to an arahant is to give to the sangha. However, if you give to the sangha. Uh, even higher than that is to give to the dual sangha, yeah, bhikkhunis and bhikkhus. Uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, and uh, even higher than that is to take the three refuges. Even higher than that, take, practice the five precepts. Uh, even higher than that, practice metta, yeah, for one finger snap. Uh, and then you are in business. Uh, and then, and then even the highest of all is to see impermanence. Uh, that's the highest kind of merit according to this scale. Uh, because when you see impermanence deeply, that is where you emerge from the samsaric existence itself. Okay, so um, when a noble disciple re recollects the Sangha, the mind is not full of greed, hatred, and delusion. So uh, again, it's obvious here that you recollect the Sangha in a particular way. You recollect the Sangha in terms of the qualities of the Aryan Sangha. And when you recollect those qualities, well, then the mind is kind of moving towards the Dhamma. You start to understand the escape from samsaric existence. You understand what the Dhamma is all about. Uh, yeah, so you, uh, you do this. And sometimes it is interesting. Sometimes it is enough to be in the presence of someone who is very profound. Uh, and just the presence of that person makes your mind very pure. Uh, it's kind of really fascinating. Uh, I mentioned the other day how sometimes if I feel a bit out of sorts, I just go up and and kind of visit Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm is having his cup of tea. He always has the same kind of a sequence. He comes up, he sits down at six o'clock, he has a cup of tea, he has three pieces of chocolate, one piece of kind of whatever, yeah? And that would have every night, so always the same thing. Yeah? This is the other thing about the noble ones. They're not interested in experimenting in the world of the five senses. They don't care about the world of the five senses. They do it to kind of give them a boost of energy or whatever, yeah? So every day is the same, yeah? And they're very happy with that. Uh, don't want to experiment. Forget about that. Uh, you know, the sign of Aryans. Uh. And so Ad Adam Ram sits there, yeah, and I come in and he says, oh, he says, you know, good evening to me or something like that. Uh, and I say, good evening in return. Uh, and I sit down, yeah, I make a cup of tea for myself. Uh, don't say anything here. Yeah. No need to say anything. Yeah. I just sit there, drink my cup of tea. After 10 minutes, I feel quite good, yeah, quite happy. Energy is back, and then I walk, <laughs> go back to my duty, yeah. And it's kind of amazing, yeah, how it kind of it just brings that energy back to you. It's like the atmosphere has a certain uh, power in the presence of certain people, yeah. And it's kind of very beautiful. Yeah? So sometimes when you get a really good teacher, you don't really, you hang out with that teacher, yeah. That's kind of the idea. And this is the hanging out with the Aryans. Uh, and so sometimes it is useful to uh, visit such teachers to get that feeling, uh, what it means to be in the presence of something special. Uh, it gives gives rise to more confidence that this path actually works, uh, yeah, because you can see the Dhamma in the uh, lived presence of that person. Uh, this is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, they have entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the Sangha. So, uh, there you are, these are the first three recollections, uh, and uh, it has taken the whole day. I didn't know it was going to take so long, but that's usually how it goes. Uh. So uh, that is all for now, so let's have a break uh, and come back at uh, 4.30.